So I'm going to go ahead and kick us off and get started. Um, my name is Natalie Frank. I am one of the co-founders of the Rising Tide Society. I'm also the head of community at HoneyBook, and I'm so excited to welcome you to our Global Tuesdays Together on brand voice and copywriting. For those of you who are new, I always love to kick us off by talking a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, so the Rising Tide Society is a community of small business owners and creative entrepreneurs who unite in the spirit of community over competition. We have over 400 local chapters led by extraordinary, must emphasize, <laughs> extraordinary volunteer leaders, co-leaders, and chairs. We have a Facebook group of over 77,000 community members that are facilitated by yet again, another extraordinary group of online moderators. And we have educational resources released almost daily, including blog posts, webinars, templates, monthly downloadable guides, and so much more. Many of those items being created by some of the folks on today's call, which is really excited. We are powered by HoneyBook, and we believe that when creatives rise, rise when small business owners are empowered to thrive, the world is changed for the better. So back in mid-March, as all of us know, the world was changed by a global pandemic. And in that moment, we realized that it would no longer be safe for our chapters to meet together in person, face to face. And so we started these Global Tuesdays Together events as a way for us to still connect, to get together virtually, to share knowledge and education, um, a great jumping off point for new relationships to form. And we've seen that happen. The chat oftentimes, y'all, in these meetups is just constantly flowing with questions and feedback and ideas and advice for what's worked for many of you. And so our hope here is that, I mean, you'll notice, um, unlike a lot of traditional webinars where you don't have this ability to engage, um, we wanna encourage you to be active in the chat throughout the course of today's Tuesdays together. Although we can't be together in person, our hope um, with all that we do is to facilitate a space where we can connect, we can get that opportunity to share with one another and really get to know one another. So I wanna encourage everybody to look at the chat as, as your way to do just that. Now, to kick us off, I want to start by introducing our incredible guests today, and we have some really incredible guests today. Um, first up, we have Aaliyah Walker. Aaliyah is an email marketing copywriter and the founder of The Hill Creatives. She helps creatives turned educators create marketing strategies for their digital products. When she's not working one-on-one, -on -one, creating and implementing evergreen strategies with clients, you'll probably find her teaching the importance of welcome sequences to an audience like Creative at Heart, Summit in a Box, Pin Potential Summit, Rebel Boss, and other super niche down summits where she can help prepare you to scale in a way that creates less stress and more sales. A creative writing major turned web developer with a few stops in between, Aaliyah's found a way to blend her love of words and tech skills to create experiences that move customers and clients into action, aka ka-ching, and that, which by the way, favorite sound on the HoneyBook app. And that equals profits in your pocket so that you can spend more time serving your people, building your dream business, and your dream life. Aaliyah, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so excited to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. Oh my gosh, I'm pumped. All right, here we go. We've got another incredible guest joining us as well, um, Lauren Carnes. With a background in public relations and social media marketing, Lauren has always been a lover of telling great stories. For six years, she worked alongside international brands, including Nike, Airstream, the John Maxwell Company, and Chick-fil-A, defining unique elements of their stories and serving as their brand voice through digital, print, and in-person engagements. After launching a photography business in May of 2014, Lauren began focusing on merging photography with brand messaging strategy by coaching creative and lifestyle businesses on aligning communications, marketing, and imagery. Now, as a communication strategist and photographer, she has the opportunity to pursue two elements of storytelling in one business, helping creatives make an impact in what they do best. When she's not in the office, she can be found cooking. Follow her Instagram for the most scrumptious of all recipes. I know, right? Um, hosting friends or exploring new cities with her husband, son, and fur baby. Lauren, welcome. We're so excited to have you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. We just had someone come and drop something on the porch. So if you saw me go and wave to them, that's where I was. <laughs> I love it. I love it. No worries. No worries. Right on time. Right back on time. Um, and then the third uh, guest that we have today, someone that I get to work with every day at HoneyBuck, who is amazing, uh, the one and only Sabrina Pies. Sabrina started Quiet Like Horses as a blog where lifestyle meets personal essays. It's been featured on BuzzFeed, Yumly, Mashable, Google's Blogs of Note, and the literary site Full Grown People. 
After working with countless entrepreneurs in her role at HoneyBook, managing content marketing strategy, she fell in love with small business owners, especially their passion and their brand stories. But she also saw how they didn't always know how to share them in a way that made people pay attention. And that's when Quiet Like Horses went on a mission to help small business owners become better writers. Because just as much as your story matters, so does the way that you tell it. Sabrina, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I feel like we have the dream team trio today. And I've been saying that behind the scenes um, with Kate and our team all week. See, look, Kate, yes, we do. I know. We're so excited. We're really, really honored to have all three of you here. Um, truly powerhouses, all in your own rights. And just to have you in one space together, this is... Um, we keep using the word unprecedented in 2020, but this is a good way to use the word unprecedented in 2020. It is an unprecedented moment and day. Um, before we dive into the questions, I want to let everyone know who is joining us today that we want to encourage you, if you get a chance to share how you're tuning in today, where you're tuning in from anywhere in the world, um, and go ahead and share that if you can on Instagram stories and feel free to tag us at HoneyBook and at Rising Tide Society, as well as our incredible speakers that we have here today. We're going to be giving away a shirt and or mug, I believe, Kate can confirm, from our Rising Tide shop uh, to one lucky winner who shares how they're tuning in or what they're learning or a tidbit that they're going to take away and implement into their brand or business. So make sure as you're listening today, feel free to share um, what you're learning and how you're watching us over on Instagram stories. Be sure to tag us as that's how we'll be determining um, our winner. Awesome. All right. Is everyone ready to jump into our questions? How do we feel? Yes. Okay. Let's do it. Ready. So to kick it off, um, this is a, a question that I know personally, I've actually asked, um, all three of you at different points, um, you know, in our personal relationship. And it's one that I think many people listening today have also asked themselves or are concerned about. And this is what are the biggest missteps that we can make as business owners when it comes to brand voice and copywriting? What mistakes are we making? Where are we potentially falling short? I'm not sure who wants to kick us off with their best answer, but I'd love to hear. I can start really high level. Um, one of the things that I see a lot is everyone wants to put everything inside of their brand and feel like their entire being, their entire purse, like their whole life history needs to be shared in order for you to be a brand. And that's not true. Um, you find things to focus on that are going to actually connect you to your audience. And that's where you get started. And it gets easier when like, instead of talking about every single thing going on, you can talk about three things that are really important to you. And more importantly, very, very important to your customer. And you can connect with them there. And I think that's the place to get started with developing your brand voice um, is honing in on what's going to be more important versus feeling like you need to put every single thing in there. Just to build off of that, I love that, Aaliyah. Um, I'd say a big misstep I see is that a lot of business owners will talk about themselves and put themselves at the center of their messaging. And it's great, you know, there's a place for talking about yourself, but people are coming to you because you have this talent, right? And they have this need or this goal or this dream, and they want your help to get them there. And so I think, um, instead of talking all about yourself and like what you love to do, what your skills are, reframing it to talk about, you know, like an intro, for example, saying like, let's talk if you are, and then insert your audience's pain points, and then talking about how you can help them and how you're equipped with all your special skills to do that. I love that. I think that both of those things are so accurate. And I think that um, something in addition to that to think of and the idea I see over here, someone saying that helps. I don't want to share everything anyway. I think a lot of times we think that we do have to share everything and it almost allows us to set a boundary saying these are the types of things that fall into the categories of what kind of my cornerstone content will be or what I want to be known for. Um, and that might include some personal elements of your brand. It might include some details about your personal story, but also really what it comes down to is like they, like the other ladies have said, is that it's really important to remember the one person that you're speaking to. And I think a lot of times the misstep that I see is that people talk to everyone, right? It's the idea that if you're talking to everyone, you're not talking to anyone, or if it's everyone's job, it's no one's job. Um, um, and so I think really, really honing in on that one person, 
that you're speaking to instead of speaking to the masses will allow you to know exactly what it is that you're supposed to be sharing, what it is that you're supposed to be talking about, and really will let you take that next step to discover what that one person and only that one person, what their pain points are, what their needs, what their wants are, and where those align with what your story includes. And so it allows you to have a little bit of a boundary instead of feeling like you need to include everything in the kitchen sink. I think that's super true. And like one way you can check yourself is if you find yourself writing, hey, you guys are all of you people, then you find, okay, you're not talking to one person. So whether it's a social post and you need to switch that out with like you talking to one person, or if you're writing an email, I love to just start it with like dear and put my um, client avatar's name in there. And so that just helps you like, okay, I'm talking to this one single person as I'm writing everything versus feeling like I need to please every single person right now. I love that. I love that you have the name of the person. I think that that's so key. It's almost like writing to a friend or talking yeah. to a friend. A lot of times I will literally take my phone and voice memo to myself if I'm prepping to write an email or prepping to write a social caption. If it's just something, what would I say to this friend that I'm connecting with this one person? And so what would I do? I would just talk it out to that one person. I love that idea. Yeah. Amazing. And I love this too. I want to kind of ask a ancillary question to what we're talking about. Somebody asked a little, or just mentioned that they struggle with the personal side, how much personal to share of their own story into that brand voice. And we've, we've lightly touched on it, but I am going to be really direct and just ask, how do we navigate that? How do we make that determination on, um, you know, whether our brand, uh, should be one where we're very much personal, like our face is very centric, our own story is very centric, or one maybe a brand that is not. Like, how do you make that determination? And any advice that you might have there, I think would be really helpful. I love, I think as small businesses, I think it's having a strong personal brand is very important. Um, and so I love stories. I think stories are so important for sharing and trying to be relatable with your audience. And so for my brand, you'll see that a lot of stories do come into play, but um, I think Aaliyah touched on it or Lauren touched on it. You don't have to include everything. You don't have to include things that make you feel uncomfortable, but if it's something that is going to make you feel relatable is a nice tie in or an example for what you're talking about in your business, then I think that can be a nice thing to include. Yeah, I think I got this from Jessica Rasdell. Um, speaker coach to all of them. Amazing. So many amazing people. Um, share your scars, not your wounds. So there's something that makes you feel really uncomfortable. And it's something that maybe you're living in the moment of, maybe it's not the right time to share that quite yet. Um, if you find yourself breaking down every time you tell a story, maybe it's because you're still working through healing it, um, healing through it. So it's not going to be the best thing. It's not, and it's not going to make you feel comfortable and you're just going to stop sharing things entirely. Um, so that's another pointer I just want to share. I love that. No, I've heard that phrase before, and I think it's so valuable for us to remember, um, especially because of the fact that a lot of times when we are thinking of kind of those pain points and touching on how we can really solve problems for people, a lot of times we want to show that transformation, right? And our brand voice and our copywriting, if there's something that we've been through that potentially our target, target audience has also experienced, we can almost use ourselves if we feel so comfortable, right? If we feel that level of connection to where our audience, we think that they would benefit from hearing it. And we feel as though we can kind of share the, um, the transformation and share the outcome that we've experienced. Experience. That can help them to see that it is possible, that transformation is possible, whether it is if you are a wedding photographer and you experienced wedding photography from a like couple's perspective and you had either a great or not so great experience, um, what that transformation looks like on the other side, or if you are a brand coach or a marketing coach and you want to show people that there was a time in which, you know, my inbox was crickets too, but there is a world in which this is possible. And I believed X, Y, Z, but now look at what the difference is. I think that that's when the personal stories really are really valuable. Being able to show those results and show that benefit. And once again, kind of like I mentioned earlier, having a boundary, um, knowing maybe there are little tidbits of your story that you don't share. Maybe there are different elements that you highlight, but ultimately finding where the values and the results and transformation are important for your client is what you can determine is best for your per personal story to be incorporated in. So that's always what I go back to is kind of remembering like, these are the things I do share. These are the things that I don't. This is why it's important for my client, right? I 
I love it. We've got a question here from Lillian Garcia who asks, what if you've never made your brand about yourself? Would it be weird to start after so many years? And actually I'll add a bit, I'll build on that because Lillian, I, something that I've heard a lot in our Tuesdays Together groups, just in general, um, being in so many of them is a lot of people just questioning, like, how do I take that first step? How do I bring a little more of myself to my job, to my, my brand, to how I communicate on social? How do you take that first step? And like she said, would it be weird to start after so many years? I'm not sure if anyone has experienced that maybe themselves too, or has navigated that. So Lillian, I think that's such a good question. Um, a lot of my coaching clients for communications and marketing coaching specifically have to do with pivots or transitions in their business, kind of changing something that they previously did or adding a new service, adding a new product. Um, and I think that this is a great example. I don't think it's weird by any means. I don't think that it's ever too late to incorporate more of your own personality into your business if you are the face of your business. Um, and I think that that's really important to remember is if people come to your brick and mortar bridal shop because they want the experience to work with Lillian and to experience the joy that you bring into the bridal shopping experience or something specific about um, your particular shop, if it involves you, I think that it's never too late to start incorporating your personality and your brand into it. I would even argue that probably there's a good chance that if you are running a brick and mortar shop that you are there a lot of days of the week um, and that people are experiencing you one on one when they come into the shop. And so I think that giving them a friendly face online makes it consistent. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about this idea of consistency later, but it makes it consistent so that people know that the person that they see online is who they will expect to see in person, that they can expect that same sort of personality, that warmth, that excitement, that, you know, passion for doing the bridal shopping process that they can expect that also in person. And so I think just knowing that it's never too late to start incorporating some in, and I'm sure you'll get some great tips on how to be able to do that during this time, but more than anything, just dipping your toe in the water, knowing that it doesn't have to be perfect from the start, figuring out what your client needs and what their pain points, what their excitement is, where you can meet them exactly where you're at and just start speaking to that. Maybe today, maybe your goal is to get on your Instagram stories and say, Hey, and just connect with, you know, connect with that one person. I think it's a great place to start. I love it. And a question building upon that, that I actually want to pass over to Aaliyah here um, is from Kristen Archer. And she asks, how do you balance people saying that customers buy from a person and not a brand while also putting yourself at, at the center? How do you navigate that challenge? I love that because one of the things I say all the time is people don't buy from businesses. They buy from people. Um, and so if you are your brand, that is who they're buying from. So if you are the person that, especially if you're service-based and people work one-on-one -on -one with you, like you are your brand and they need to be able to connect with you in order to work with you from there on. So um, I think that is really important. Like if we're working on building yourself as a personal brand, that you're approachable, um, that someone can engage with you and that is how you're going to connect and um, grow your customer base and just reach the right people more. So I think that's that's exactly what you should be focusing on is making sure that you are a person who um, people connect with because we all do similar things and there's a similar reason to hire each one of us, but we're all different. We do what we do a little bit differently. Um, and that is important to know, like there are so many people who do what you do and you just need to be able to connect first as a person, especially when you're a small business owner um, and they are going to interact with you a lot. Um, I think that's really important. Yeah. And I think that's where the personal stories come into play mm -hmm. is that there, there are so many people that do what we do, but your personal story is going to resonate with someone and someone else's story is going to resonate with someone else. So that's how you can really differentiate yourself and stand out. Okay. Let's say you're trying to do the opposite. I love it here. Susanna Bowie says, all right, flip side to what we're talking about. My brand is me. And I'm working on incorporating services and my business now into that. How do you do the opposite of what Lillian is asking? How do you go from being maybe just a personal brand to a business with a strong personal element? Um, I saw this really great email the other day of people just introducing your whole team. Um, sometimes there's this idea of like, there's 300 people working and that's why you're all clunking cranking this stuff out, or they're just like one or two people hanging out. Um, and I think that's how you make that switch is start 
Uh, if you are always a face, if you're always speaking on Instagram, if you're always speaking at conferences and events and stuff like that, then start inviting more people from your team to do so. Whether it's just like straight up introducing them in your content or whether it's having such and such from my company speak at an event. Um, so start building it out so that it's still centered around people. Um, it's just that it's more than one now. And that's something actually we were just talking about on the rising tide side, Aaliyah, which is great. But even internally, we just had a meeting on this. A bunch of us did around, <laughs> like we have so many incredibly talented leaders and mods. And like, again, like we want their faces to be the ones you know and love when you think of rising tide. And we want to always be thinking of new ways to do that. So that applies to communities and to businesses, like elevating and um, showcasing the incredible team that you have and kind of expanding it beyond yourself. I think that's a really powerful, powerful bit of advice. Amazing. Okay. We have two questions here that kind of parallel one another um, in regards to this. I'll start with Carly's and then um, build to yours, Kelly. So Carly asks, as a coach and mentor business, do you think making yourself the brand is better than having a company name? I see so many people make their name their brand. Um, so like using their name rather than naming their business something separate. Um, Kelly kind of built on this and she said, yeah, one of my clients created my new branding and they called me the HR nerd. And it kind of stuck. Now people see me as their personal HR nerd in their corner in their business. So just kind of echoing that question, should I speak as my business or, um, you know, as this HR nerd to get connected to my clients or like, where is that advice in terms of maybe the naming, but even like who that voice is, is that voice the individual? Is that voice the brand? Do we have any advice? Because even on this panel, we have diff we have differing brand structures, some with the name of who you are and some um, with a, a business named um something separate. So I'd love to get any advice on maybe naming, but also the actual um, mouthpiece that the brand voice is delivered through. Like who is that? And what recommendations do you have? So I am on the side of that. My name is my business. And part of that is because, um, like Natalie mentioned, I have a lot of different things under one umbrella. And so for me, it is something that my, you know, my photography side of things is different than the communications and coaching side of things. And, um, but ultimately I like to think of it kind of as that umbrella. So the voice is still for me specifically, it's still going to be Lauren. It's still going to be, that's, this is who, you know, you're going to get no matter what you hire me for, but that's not the same for all of my clients. For some of my clients, it is something that, um, a, an actual, a name that is not the personal name is going to work better, especially if they envision that long term, they would like to hire on a team that they would like to have multiple people, let's say, for the personal HR nerd in the corner, if you envision kind of almost an agency concept for many HR nerds on your team, that's a great example of um, when you might determine that it might make more sense to have something like the HR nerd, right, as a business name. Um, but I think ultimately remembering that there always is going to be someone who is at the front facing, right, who is the person who is the team and or who is the front of the team, and especially until you build that team. So knowing that ultimately when you are speaking, um, that it can come from the perspective, it, it will be your voice, let's say, so it will be Carly speaking, or let's see, Kelly, Kelly, um, Kelly speaking, and she may be asking, or Kelly, you may be saying something from the perspective of, I am Kelly, the leader of the HR nerd team, but this is what the full picture looks like. These are the types of offerings and services that we offer for our clients. This is what we do, um, but you being almost that mouthpiece, if you can think of it that way. And I think it goes back, Susanna and I actually know each other personally. And so Susanna, I know that we've chatted about this otherwise, but it goes back to that idea of how to start incorporating um, services into your name, whatever it is that you currently do into the name or into the brand that you've built or maybe that you have around a specific name, being able to start kind of talking about the things that you do and the results that you've provided for others. So from the perspective of the client, Kelly, I love that you said one of my clients created my new branding. They called me the HR nerd and it kind of stuck. That right there is powerful social proof. And social proof is really, really important for the, um, the ability to sell and copywriting and to connect with clients, to be able to show them that they they see me as their personal HR nerd in their corner, right? How many of us, I know I would, would love someone in my corner right here being my personal HR nerd, like Kelly, 
come on, come and hang out with me. Um, and I think that that's a great example of, yes, you are Kelly. Yes, you've been speaking about this, but someone else has said something about you that really stuck. Um, this is a great example of when you are able to just really kind of lean into that and see where it goes from there. Start using that on some copy. Start incorporating that into testimonials um, and lean into that and know that that might be something that really connects with clients. It's connecting with me. I totally get that. Personal HR nerd in my corner. Come on. I agree to like everything Lauren just said. Um, it makes so much sense. And yeah, it's, it's a perfect, I, right now I also have uh, my name as my business name. And that's because I was doing a lot of things um, and when I started my business and I have made shifts. And so like, I appreciate not needing to change my name every five seconds. Um, but now I am moving more into the agency model. So I will be changing um, soon and walking away from but I'll still be Aaliyah, I'll always be Aaliyah and that kind of thing. And like, I'll still be the front and center. Um, but yeah, like it makes complete sense. It just depends on where you are and what kind of um, system you want to set up, structure you want to set up in your business. And to kind of pass um, the mic over to Sabrina, we got a question earlier here that I, um, we got, we, the chat continued flowing and I don't want to leave Sarah's question unanswered. And I want to direct it at you, Sabrina, because on the HoneyBook side and on the Rising Tide side, um, you tackle this problem very, very, very well. Um, and so Sarah asks, if your target audience is varied and transcends different age groups, backgrounds, on the Rising Tide HoneyBook side, we have verticals galore. I mean, from photographers to strategists to artists to makers, boutique owners, I mean, you name it, any type of small business or creative entrepreneur we have to create content for and serve um, through our blog. She asks, how do you craft content that feels like you're talking to one person um, that still feels relevant to these, these diverse groups that you might be serving? Or when you have sort of these different backgrounds or different almost audience members, um, how do you still keep it personal? How do you still make it feel relevant? Do you have any advice there for Sarah? I think it comes back down to, again, I sound like a broken record, but to your audience's pain points. And our audience at HoneyBook and Rising Tide is so varied, but everyone is struggling with um, growing their business, right? Or learning how to use digital invoices, for example. And so they all have the same pain points, even though they do different things. But if you can speak to that problem that everyone has and how you can help solve that, that's a way to um, create one piece of content for many. Amazing. And we have a question here um, from Tabitha Holloman, who I personally love, and I know Lauren knows as well. Um, she's amazing. Talk about Resilient Woman series. I have to give you a shout out, um, Tabitha. So she asks, is it okay to combine two brandings for two business concepts? So I am a tax accountant, but also want to be a consultant or coach. Would you recommend combining the two? Would it cause confusion? I no longer um, carry two different brands. So how do you determine, um, since we're talking as well, we kind of jump from names back, but jumping back into names, how do you determine that, that brand, that overarching brand or any advice that you have um, anyone today? Like, should you keep it separate? Do you combine it? Um, some of you guys do many things under one umbrella. So I'm curious to hear what your gut feeling is on this one as well. Um, because of the fact that, oh, Aaliyah, go for it. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you can, um, you can fill it out even more, but are there different, are they different audiences is my main question. So who are you serving? Are you, um, is it that they're like level one and level two in the same industry or is it that they're just like completely separate, different, separate, separate people? If they're completely separate, that's where it makes sense to have those two different brands so that you can create that different content. I feel like you're, you're like, they are separate and you don't want to keep them as two separate brands. I'm so sorry that this is an answer you might not want to hear, but um, if you're speaking to two different people, then you're going to need to have those, have those separate is the, the very short answer. Yeah. And to take it one step further, um, if it is something that you find that the needs are the same for both of those people, right? So specifically Tabitha, 
you offer tax accounting. And for those of you who don't know, Tabitha is my accountant. She is amazing. Um, she specifically works with creative entrepreneurs, which is why I'm bringing this up. Because Tabitha, if your goal is to move forward with doing coaching and consulting for creative entrepreneurs, that is gonna look a little different than if your goal is to do coaching and consulting for other tax accountants, right? That's gonna be a different audience and will also determine whether or not um, the messaging would align for all of those people to be under the same roof. And so I just want you to kind of think through what is your ultimate goal? What is the destination? What's, that, what's the um, item that you're working toward? And do those audiences, do their core values align? Do their needs align? And then ultimately will the messaging align? And if the answer of all of those is yes, then I think it's okay to have it all under one roof. Um, but ultimately, I do think that it's important just to remember who is that audience that you're speaking to, just like Leah said. I think that's super key. And once you determine that audience that you're speaking to, I have to ask another question, um, one that we see a lot as well on the Rising Tide and HoneyBook side, and this is about copy that converts. So I'm curious to hear from all of you, and I know, Aaliyah, this is something that you do day in and day out on the email marketing side, especially with just building out that strategy, but is there a formula or a benchmark way to measure if your messaging is resonating with your audience? Um, and how do you determine if copy is converting? I mean, is this something where we're looking at engagement or referrals or is it part of sales and booking? Any advice that all three of you could give? I'd love Aliyah to kick us off here um, in regards to copy that converts would be so valuable. Well, this is all, the answer is like all the things. Um, one of the things you want to start with is what is your CTA, your call to action? And you should only have one of them in a piece of content. So you want to start looking at, are they doing that thing that I wanted them to do? So if what you want them to do is read a blog post um, and that's what's happening, then that copy is converting based on your CTA. Um, and the other thing that I always suggest, if you haven't done this in a while, is actually like get on the phone or a Zoom, call with the person and ask them about does my does my do these things resonate with you so whether it's a sales page and having them walk through it and explain like yeah i connect with this yes this makes sense to me no i don't understand what this is saying um or emails like user interviews are so so useful and if you just need a real gut check i think they're great to do um but i think sabrina has some great stuff about ctas to talk about but that's the place to start your cta are they doing that thing yes cool it is no they're not um, and then we want to start looking at like what it is that you're actually putting in your content and why they're not, why they're not resonating. And it could be that there's like too many CTAs. That's another thing that's happening often as well. Um, so yeah, Sabrina, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, before I write, I, and what I recommend before, um, anyone writes is to think about what the goal of what you're writing is. Like if you're writing an email, is the goal for engagement? Is it a welcome email? Or is it a sales email where you want to get someone to buy something? And so um, defining your goal first and then uh, the CTAs, like Leah said, are so, so important. Um, and then how do you measure based on your goal, right? So if it's like a welcome email, you want to see engagement, right? You want to see high open rates. You want to see high click-through rates. Um, so start to measure that through your email marketing um, and then develop benchmarks. So on average, like let's say for 2020, what is your average open rate? What are your average click-through rates? And then for each email, seeing if you're beating your benchmark. And then in the next email, what can you start to tweak in the CTA? Can you make it shorter? Can you make it snappier to see if you can increase those? Um, and that's how you start to increase those conversion rates. I think that's such a great point. I absolutely agree with Sabrina about the idea of starting with the goal in mind. And I recommend that for when you're writing copy specifically for conversion, always to start with the goal in mind. And that goes for literally anything that you're writing. So not just for emails. I think something that a lot of times people forget is that this applies on websites wholeheartedly. Every single, so I use show it for my website and every single, they call it canvas. So if you can envision like every single block of a website should lead to the next block, should lead to the end, should lead to the goal on each individual page. And so if you think about that, every piece of copy or every single image, everything that has a place and that is front facing that your audience can see should have one goal in mind, which is to lead the person to the next step. 
Our goal is that we wouldn't let our audience just see something and be like, I don't really know where to go from here. I don't know what to do now. Our goal is that they would see it and beyond a shadow of a doubt know that their next step is to for either their eye to track down the page or then for them to look at a gallery or for them to click to opt in or for them to um, open an email, see the subject line, open an email. Every single item has a goal of the next step. And so just remembering that, that it's all really important. And so more is not always better. Sometimes more is more, right? There are times when more is more, but if it doesn't accomplish a goal, then I would argue that you need to sit down and say, why am I using this? Why is it here? Is there a reason that it's here? And if there's not, could it be replaced with something better? Or is this a case where less is more? So always remember that goal for everything as you're going down the page or down an email. Yeah, and to piggyback on that, um, as much as we want to move people to the next step, we also want to push away people who don't want to be there. Um, so if there's someone who just doesn't connect with whatever is going on, then you want to be it, for it to be okay for them to go, um, because we want to speak to the people who we want to speak to, and we want everyone else to go find that person for them. So um, as much as we want to attract, we have to also think about repelling and being okay with that. Like it's not about having a massive list; it's about having an engaged list. Um, and following on Instagram and so on and so forth. So like always think about making sure you are connecting with the right person and then everyone else knows that, all right, she might not be the best person to help me in this. Let me go find that person for me. We all mic drop after that because I did. And uh, yeah, I know. And especially the attracting and repelling. Look, this is something that as business owners, we often love the attracting. We don't so much enjoy the repelling. But as you said, it's not about having the biggest list on the block. It is about having the most deeply engaged and connected list, regardless of size. Like it's about that connection and um, that open rate, that click through rate, the way that they're connecting. I love it. Mic drop. Yes. Um, one thing too, I'll share an anecdote way back in the day. It was maybe four way back in the day. It was like three years ago. I, I feel like Lauren, you were around at this point and we did our uh, rising tide summit and we constructed, um, Jess Chang and I constructed and Kate made the world's best, what we thought landing page for the rising tide summit. I promise there's a point to the story and it talk about copy. I mean, we had all the copy, all the copy all day long, every bit you could imagine talking about our speakers. I mean, this page was massive. It was incredibly robust and our design team did a great job on it. But when we launched, we weren't seeing conversion to this summit. We weren't, we weren't seeing people within an hour. It was really clear. Like they weren't converting. And so um, we basically looked at one another and we said, get rid of all of it. Get rid of the entire LP. We're going to have a one paragraph about what it is and a giant buy now button. That's it. And we took our beautiful, robust landing page with like images and text galore. And we went down to a bare bones page. And all of a sudden we witnessed conversions skyrocket. It was like ding, 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 ding. And we realized that we had done all the things. You got it. We weren't being simple. We weren't being concise. So I just want to affirm everything that we just heard. I have witnessed it. I have done the beautiful LP and witnessed no one buy. Um, and also seeing the opposite of just having very clear copy, very clear call to action, um, you know, aligning with, with that goal, like Sabrina talked about going back to that goal, that foundational purpose of why are we doing this and what is our goal for them? It's, it's so, so, so critical and important. So I'm um, taking a gentle um, pivot here into a conversation um, around consistency. So um, it's a word we hear a lot on social media. It's a word we hear a lot in the, the brand space, um, but consistency really is key in the copywriting process. And so I'm curious how often should we be talking to our audiences? Um, you know, we, we do see this question coming up a lot and um, people often worry and they have this fear if they're being too frequent that it could be felt like they're being sleazy or salesy or overly pushy. Um, but yet we're also hearing the opposite message. You know, you want to be out there. You want to be communicating frequently. Uh, so I would love to hear maybe from each of you, what does that consistency look like when it comes to brand voice and copywriting? Um, what advice do you have, whether it's on the email side or the social side, or maybe holistically that we can take away from today's Tuesdays together and really feel confident in how we approach our audiences? I think that's an amazing question because I think so often we, like you said, we can feel as though we are going to push people away because we're being too much, right? But I just want to debunk the myth right away that consistency is really, so uh, really I want you to remember that consistency breeds confidence and being able to see the same 
conversation, the same message, the same marketing, the same elements on every single platform is really the way that our audience and our target client is going to feel confident that we can do what we can do, that we have done it for others and we will do it for them, right? And so when we're thinking about how often each platform is going to be different, each audience is gonna be different. And so this is when I really challenge each person to sit down and kind of think through who that one person is, who that individual that they're speaking to is, and know that um, whatever you are trying to sell, that it is not too much to repeat the same thing again and again and again on each platform. Because one, we all know about the algorithm, right? We could talk about that all day long, I feel like. Um, but there's a good chance that your target audience may not see that first post that you do about something. And so we need consistency in order to repeat, to repurpose, to reiterate. We need to actually say these things again and again, not just on an Instagram feed, but then to take it one step further and to go a little deeper in Instagram stories. Because if you think about the general audience might be scrolling and seeing on an Instagram feed post, but then you have to opt in a little bit further to see something on stories. And then you have to opt in a little further to DM someone, which the great thing about DMs is that you actually can be uber consistent in responding and engaging in the same way and sending them over a direct link, a URL that can link out, which will be then consistent in the way that you are communicating on your website or on a landing page. And so I encourage people, instead of thinking how much, um, really, in, instead of thinking of how often, think of it as where are you speaking and are all those platforms consistent? And ultimately, that is what's going to breed the confidence that your client understands what it is, who you are, what you do, how you can do it for them, and what the results or transformation are that you can provide. And that is where consistency is really a game changer, is what I believe. Um, on the email side of it, consistency does start with the welcome sequence always, which is why I talk about them so much. And I just think once you get that together, things fall into place so much. Um, you're starting to introduce yourself. You're letting people know what to expect, um, how you can help them. And I think it's just really important to have that like strong, build that strong foundational relationship in the beginning when they have said, I trust you enough to hand over my personal details and let you show up in my inbox um, and just show up and like say, hey, I appreciate it. And here's how I can help you. There, there's a such thing with too much one email it's email marketing so be comfortable selling and in general your business be comfortable selling um but you don't have to beat people over the head like every email buy my thing buy my thing buy it now like you don't have to do that um whatsoever so i love the three to one rule so like for every three gives that's i have one ask um so think about it that way like if you send weekly emails know that like three of them have to are going to be hardcore like um content and this is what how like mine are super meta I'm talking about emails and emails um and the last one I'm going to talk about an offer so um that can help you as well just feel like okay cool I have a process for how I'm going to show up selling um and that'll make me feel you know immediately take away some of this lease factor from it um yeah I think that does that hit it hit, I, th I think that's the email side of it um really is just like starting off with that welcome sequence and making sure that you are providing value as well um and then just remembering it's marketing and that you can sell inside of emails okay these ladies like stole the words from my mouth those are perfect just such great answers um just to add on to that Lauren talked about um, consistency breeding confidence and that's so true and I also think it breeds confidence within you as a business owner so the more you can say your message and really believe in your message the more confident you're gonna get and you're gonna exude that confidence and people are gonna be attracted to that and they're gonna see that and they're gonna say I want whatever that is because she believes in that so strongly um, so confidence definitely um, <laughs> and then also with repeating yourself, I feel like people are worried about that, but I will say that when you create something, it's not always going to resonate in one platform or in one format. So I've written a blog post and I thought it was really great, but it kind of fell flat and then I repurposed it into a webinar and it did amazing. It got such better engagement. People responded and resonated with it so much more. So there's no harm in repurposing your content and just being consistent in your core messaging. We have a question here from Carrie and then a resounding number of comments around it, which I, I love um, that, I, that I want us to cover here. Carrie says, introvert here, there are so many big personalities out there. 
any tips for how I can lean into my quieter personality in my branding and just resounding advice here from so many other introverts and, and lovers of introverts. Um, but I'd love to hear from all three of you. Look, I, I see this too. I see, I mean, even with reels that launch and you see a lot of extroverted personalities jumping center stage and, um, there's so much power in our, our introvert business owners. Any advice you have for them to lean into that uniqueness and see it as a strength and not as a weakness? Um, I shared in the comments that I'm actually an introvert in real life. Um, and I just find a way to turn it on for, um, turn it on for, to show up for my business and my audience. I heard something a while ago that said, um, by you being quiet, you are doing your audience, your clients, your customers a disservice by not sharing what it is that you have. So uh, you don't have to be all over the place and do every single thing. Um, find a way to, if you could, that's what helps by having like an act a core message. So know that I only have to speak about this thing and I only have to do it for this amount of time. And then I can go back and hide inside of my um, closet if I want to, or whatever it is. Like, what, however you decompress, like that's what you need to do, but just find a way to turn it on, like really turn it on for time, show up um, because you are going to provide so much value for the people you need to. So um, you're, yeah, it's only a credit to you and to help them by doing it and showing up. Like you don't have to be on all of the time um, for sure. Um, a friend of mine, Anne Marie taught me this trick and it's, I don't know, I call it the dinner party trick. And it's basically where you just embrace kind of who you are. But if you imagine yourself at a dinner party, you're sitting there, you're just being your introvert self and you know, all your ideal clients are around you. How would you talk to them? Like how, what would you, what would the stories you tell be? How would you listen to them? What would you share? Um, and so when you're creating content, you don't have to be that person that you see on reels that's like dancing and like have the perfect moves. Um, but just be you and just, how would you communicate? Like, let's say you're creating a reels for someone sitting next to you at that dinner party. You know, how would you let that kind of your, your inner light shine, um, but without being like someone who you're not? I also think the power of being an introvert. I am an extrovert, um, but I am a lover of introverts. Natalie, you mentioned that I have so many introverts in my life that I love, my husband included. Um, and I think the power of introverts is that introverts are incredible at asking questions and listening. And that is ultimately one of the most important things that we can do in our businesses and as we are connecting with and learning from our potential clients. And so leaning into that, finding questions that help you learn more about your clients so that you can serve them better in your really unique way is of the utmost importance. And so I think that being an introvert for so many reasons is actually um, a huge benefit in the creative entrepreneur and small business world. And so asking those questions can really be a game changer because you then have the opportunity to connect with them on an even deeper level. A mentor of mine said something very similar once. Um, Douglas Atkin, former um, global head of community of Airbnb, told me that introverts often make the most profound leaders um, because they are always listening and always paying attention to what others are saying. And if, if they're able to do that, then they're able to show up and to serve. And he was speaking in regards to community leadership, but I see it in business ownership too. I think regardless of introvert or extrovert, knowing yourself and leveraging that superpower. I love the dinner table too, Sabrina. Go, go, like that was, I'm taking that away. Um, whether it's reels or stories or however we're approaching, it's like if you're sitting at that dinner table, how do you leverage your superpower to be authentic to you um, and to communicate in a way that um, connects with the person sitting across the table? Gold all around from all three of you. Um, we got one more question here from Kelly Loudermilk who asks, when getting started on branding and copy more seriously, does it make sense to DIY it with resources or to outsource to someone that can help? I know you all get asked this question a lot in your unique areas of expertise, but um, wh at what point does it make sense to hire an expert and how long can you DIY it until you truly need some help? Okay, I can start as well. Um, so 
I think when it comes to writing copy, you at some point need to write your own copy because that's how you're going to learn it. Yeah, that's how you're going to understand your, your customers, your clients, and you know them best. Um, so if you need help, then outsourcing your strategy is a really good idea, whether that's like finding a template or hopping on a call with um, and getting a strategy session with uh, someone who's in marketing, then that's going to be really important to do. I feel like when it's time to invest, um, one, you don't have the time to do it. Um, two, you've already done something like maybe you're selling another round of the course and it was successful and you just want to be it to be even more successful. Um, and you have that to invest. I think that's the time to do it. It's like, you know, you can sell, you just need a little ha- help tweaking the thing. Um, but when it comes to first building out your, your branding copy, you don't want to rely on someone else coming inside of your business to do that because at the end of the day, you still need to be able to open your mouth and sell. Um, and the best way to do that is to like write it down and figure out how to connect with someone in that way. And then if you get stuck or you're not getting the results you want, then I think that's a place where you, you might want to call in um, an expert to help you get unstuck. Amazing. So as we come and and approach the end of our hour together, um, I would really love um, for each of you to share your biggest tip as each person walks out of here that you want to make sure they take away uh, when it comes to approaching brand voice and copywriting in their business for the second half of the year that we're starting to barrel through truthfully as we approach 2021. Um, But let's leave it at that. What is your biggest tip from each of you, let's go ahead and have Lauren kick us off. I think that's a great question. I think this year has really had us all kind of come in word a little bit and focus on what it is that we can offer to the world. You know, we're hanging out at home and sheltering in place. And here we are wondering, is there a place for me? And if you could see me right now and I made a reel earlier, so maybe I'll share it if I, if you know, if I feel like I should, Um, I'm sitting at my kitchen table. And I think the thing that I really want everyone on this call on this zoom to remember is that your uniqueness is needed in this industry and your brand voice and focusing on how you can copyright to speak to that brand voice and copyright with the intent of selling is how you specifically are going to be able to have a job, have a career that allows you to actually help others with what you love to do. And so leaning into that, knowing that there is a place for you at this table, that you fit in here and that you are welcome in our crew, but ultimately that there is something only that you have, that as you're digging in, as you're evaluating your brand voice and as you're thinking through copywriting, knowing that it is important for you to be able to feel confident in sharing your unique story, sharing your unique perspective and ultimately selling that to your unique client. And so remembering that sales doesn't have to feel scary and that you are worthy of doing the work that you're doing. So that's really my best and one, I will leave you with that piece of advice. When it comes to writing copy, whatever it is you're writing, I think it's really important to keep coming back to your why. Why are you doing this for yourself? Why does your client need to hear this? Um, And that is where you're just going to really succeed is. So if you're writing something and then like, I I write something, I read it like, why is this important? Why is this here? Why do I need to have that? Um, For example, when I created the Hill, uh, founded the Hill Creatives, that brand came together in like three weeks. And it's something I would never suggest anyone do, but it was so easy because the why was like loud and in my face and it was everywhere at that time. And it was really easy for me to connect with that in my writing. Um, And that's, that's how I did that. And that's how when you're thinking about your scale and thinking about your next level is like anything you're putting out, why are you doing this? Um, And that's going to help you a lot. My biggest advice is just to keep offering value to your audience with all the content you put out. Um, Answering your why and your clients' why is a great way to figure out what that content is. And I know Lauren is a big proponent of this. I love it too, but just keeping a running list of content ideas. So if it's um, a question someone asks you, like, how do I do this? That's a great piece of content that you could put out. Um, So just having a list ready, because I know that I get so many ideas and if I don't write it down, I'm going to forget it. But it just makes it so easy when it's time to come and share valuable content out with audience, then it's um, you just go to that template or that swipe file that you have running and it just makes it so easy. 
Amazing. Amazing. Before we conclude with each of you sharing a little bit more about where people can find you and how they can connect with your business and your brand, I have two giveaway winners to announce. So I'm going to do like a fake drum roll here. So many of you shared about uh, this Global Tuesdays together. So thank you for jumping on the gram and sharing where you're tuning in from. It was really cool uh, to kind of see some of these. Um, But I want to go ahead and announce our two winners. So first winner that we have is Hannah Snyder Weddings. So Hannah, congratulations. Uh, We're going to DM you in just a little bit. In addition to that, we have Stavali Christabel, stavali.christabel. Um, you also are our second winner for our giveaway. So congratulations, Hannah and Stavali. So excited for both of you. Um, I don't know if you're still tuning in or not, but we'll make sure that we reach out via um, the Rising Tide account in just a little bit to get you guys hooked up. And uh, before we conclude, I really want to hear from each of our incredible, incredible, incredible guest speakers today, um, where we can connect further with you, how um, maybe things that you're working on. um, Like some of you mentioned little things. I want you to go deeper. Like the Hill Creators is a great example. It's extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary. Um, So let's go in the same order. We'll kick it off with Lauren. What are you working on? Where can we connect with you? You can find me most often on Instagram. My handle is at Lauren L. Carnes. I think Kate popped it in there. Maybe she'll do that again for us. And if not, I'll pop it in. Um, And my website, yes, thank you, Kate. Um, My website is laurencarnes.com. And I would love to connect with you guys. I'm here to help and assist in any way related to communications and marketing strategy. And specifically, I coach other creative entrepreneurs on how to do all the things that we were talking about today in their business and take that next step. So that is what I do. And in addition to that, I am a brand photographer as well. And I am based in Georgia, but outside of COVID time, I'm willing to travel everywhere. Aaliyah actually just traveled to me last week and did pretty much the first photo shoot that I've done since March. So it was amazing. It is wonderful. So that is where you can find me. And I am just grateful for all of you being here and to connect with you. So thanks for having us. Um, and I hang out on Instagram a lot as well, where you can see me sharing some of the amazing photos that Lauren took, um, that I'm just thrilled about. Uh, my handle is Miss Aaliyah, M-S-A-L-E-I-A. Um, right now I am working on the Hill Creatives. It is a directory for black creatives to connect us to people and brands ready to hire us. Um, I started it in June of this year after, um, George Floyd was murdered and it just, we were getting a lot of attention. So I wanted to, um, connect people and I'm, I'm just thrilled about the response that's going on. And, uh, we're actually hosting a workshop, uh, doors open up on Friday. And we're going to help you set revenue goals that make sense for you. So it's all, again, you centered, like putting you in your business. And I will be helping you create marketing strategies, which is what I do when I'm not working on the Hill Creatives, um, is I help people create evergreen marketing strategies so they can take that step back from their business and knowing that they have a sales machine always running for them. So um, yeah, I am thrilled about all those things. My website is aliawalker.com and thehillcreatives.com is available as well. So if you'd like to apply for the direct you can do so. Um, you want to check out the um, the workshop, please do. We're giving away a seat thanks to some amazing people like Natalie who have donated a seat to the workshop. Um, and yeah, you can find all that information out at thehillcreatives.com. Um, you guys can find me at quietlikehorses.com or on Instagram at quietlikehorses. Um, and I also have a free masterclass if you guys want to learn how to write irresistible copy. That's also on the website. And during the day, I'm also the content um, marketing person for HoneyBook. So if you want to chat about HoneyBook, feel free to DM me anytime. And none of this would be possible without the team at HoneyBook and one person in particular who has been rock star behind the scenes this whole time, bringing all of us together and really facilitating this amazing um, Global Tuesdays together, not just today, but every month. And that is the one and only Kate Masters. So I also want to give you, Kate, a shout out behind the scenes for all that you do for bringing us together and facilitating this space. You really are extraordinary and we love you so much. Um, truly look at this love pouring in. I know, I know Kate truly is amazing. Uh, (laughs) yay. Um, I love it whenever you pop on. Yes. All right. So in conclusion, we just want to say thank you all so, so much for joining us. Thank you to all of our incredible speakers. You are 
phenomenal. And I know everyone took some incredible information away. Um, thank you to Kate, the HoneyBook team, and all of you for investing in your business, investing in community, and believing and championing this mindset of community over competition. Thank you all. And we look forward to hanging out with you again next month.